this week. New York City in the 80s was more than just a neon-soaked playground of Wall Street excess and Studio 54 glitter. Return to a decade where in the streets, the war on drugs raged, and below them, subway crime soared. Right now, Fox 5's crime in the city, the 80s. Here are some of the crimes that gripped the five boroughs. We begin on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in early December 1980, on a day forever known as one of the darkest in music history. One of the last things John Lennon must have seen was the overweight fan who had been pestering him for days. The last time he'd been clutching a pen, he was out for an autograph. But this time he was holding a gun, and within a few moments he had taken John Lennon's life. He fired three shots, striking Lennon in the front of the body. The former Beatle tried to run, but was cut down by two more bullets as his wife stood by screaming. When we pulled up on the scene, uh, there was uh, an arrest that had already been made. Somebody was in custody. And my concern was to uh, get whoever was wounded to the hospital. It appeared he, he wouldn't wait for the ambulance. Uh, no, time. there was a bed when he was bleeding very heavily, so we picked him up and uh, put him in a radio car. And that radio car, another radio car had pulled up on the scene, and they removed him to the hospital. And we took uh, his wife to the hospital. Did you know who he was? Not at that time, no. A stretcher was wheeled in. Six to eight police officers around it, trotting, running back as fast as they could in, in, indoors. They wheeled it inside to the room right behind me. The doctor ran in, some other medical people ran in, they pulled the curtain. One police officer stood next to another police officer and whispered, it's John Lennon. At about 20, quarter to 12, I heard a woman's voice. Oh no, 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 oh no. It went on for about a minute, minute and a half. It was constantly repeated. No other words that I was able to make out. I asked the police officer, who is that? And he said it was Yoko Ono. WNEWFM, you're on the air. Hello. How could somebody like John Lennon be killed? What kind of a country is this? I remember saying this before. I remember saying this when John Kennedy was shot. I remember saying this when Martin Luther King was shot. I remember saying this when Bobby Kennedy was shot. Radio stations around the nation were flooded with calls, people who just wanted to talk about John Lennon. The word shot through the city nearly as fast as the bullets that had prompted the news. And while it's almost certain that John Lennon had died even before he reached Roosevelt Hospital's emergency room, his fans, most of them just curious, but many of them visibly distraught, came in a continuous flow. I will stay until the sunrise at the foot of this hospital and pray for his soul. Any of you who would show your love for him, please stay with me as long as you would like and pray. I'm praying the rosary. <laughs> Mr. Chapman came up behind him and called to him, Mr. Lennon, as he arrived at that doorway. And then in a combat stance, he fired, he emptied the Charter Arms 38 caliber gun that he had with him and uh, shot John Lennon. Police say the alleged gunman had met John Lennon once before that same day to have a record autographed in front of the Dakota. Why did you come here to the scene tonight? Well, I heard the news a while ago. I found it to be very shocking and I just wanted to come, sort of pay my respects in this manner. Sharing the grief with everybody else. Any WFM, you're on the air. Isn't it ironic that on a night of immense love throughout the city of New York, on the first night of real holiday spirit, when the lights on the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center would be turned on, Don Lennon would lose his life. A few years later, a day of celebration takes a grisly, unimaginable turn in Brooklyn. The scene inside the first floor flat at 1080 Liberty Avenue was compared to something one would find in a wax museum. Seven of the murder victims, all shot in the head at close range, were sitting up in living room chairs as though they were still watching the television which had been left on after the massacre. The only survivor was an 11-month-old baby who was found in that living room, covered with blood and crying. The owner of the building, Enrique Bermudez, was the father of two of the slain children. 
Detectives said Bermudez had been involved in drug deals with the man who was later charged with the 10 murders. Two months after the killings, 34-year-old Christopher Thomas was arrested. Police said Thomas had killed the 10 people in a jealous rage because he thought his ex-wife was having an affair with Bermudez. When Bermudez discovered the bodies, he first ran to the bakery next door, owned by Carmen Rossi. In court today, Rossi was the first witness to testify in the trial of Christopher Thomas, who faces life in prison if he's convicted. Earlier this week at a pretrial hearing, a jailhouse informer named Jeffrey Ford testified that Thomas had admitted to him that he killed the two women, but insisted an accomplice named Lenny had shot the children. Today, Thomas's attorney, Martin Schmuckler, told the jury Ford was a longtime police informer who hoped to trade information on Thomas for his release from jail on an armed robbery conviction. 75th Precinct Police Officer Kenneth Landgrover and his partner were the first police to arrive at the murder scene. In court, Officer Landgrover referred to a diagram of the apartment as he recounted finding body after body as he went from room to room. Landgrover, too, described a gory scene in which most of the victims seemed relaxed, as though they were very familiar with the killer. The cop said one woman was still holding a spoonful of pudding in her hand, as though she'd been frozen in the act of feeding a child. Assistant District Attorney Christopher Ulrich said Thomas and Bermudez were partners in cocaine sales, that Thomas was having money troubles, and blamed Bermudez for problems he was having with his wife. Outside the courtroom, defense attorney Schmuckler told me there is not enough evidence to show Thomas participated in the massacre, or even that one person did all the killing. Attorney Schmuckler said, quote, the only way one person could have done this is to have had a fiendish lunatic armed with a machine gun. The DA says Thomas did all the killing himself with two handguns. In the winter of the same year, New York would be the stage for one of the most controversial cases ever seen, sparked by a late night shooting on the subway. The man sitting in the back of this car is 37-year-old Bernard Goetz, a self-employed electronics calibrator from Manhattan. He says he is the subway shooter. Obtaining information about him is difficult. These pictures were taken early this morning in Concord, New Hampshire, where he remains in custody following his surprise surrender to local police. It's been 10 days since at least one of four youths asked for $5 from the passenger on the IRT subway. An eyewitness quoted the man as saying, I have $5 for each of you. He then pulled a silver revolver from his belt and shot all four of them. Overnight, police obtained a search warrant and entered Getz's ninth floor apartment on West 14th Street. They're not saying what they found. When we went to the scene today and took the elevator to the ninth floor, we found maintenance men replacing the lock which police had broken. From the hallway, Getz's apartment appeared well kept. Shiny parquet floors and electronic equipment stacked neatly in a closet. But neighbors knew of Getz not as a professional electronic calibrator, rather as a man who wanted to make 14th Street a better place. He was a member of Fab 14, a block association actively pushing the city for more police protection. The group placed garbage cans at street corners, urging people to keep 14th Street tidy. And when Fab 14 ran out of cash earlier in the year, Getz donated several hundred dollars. Getting action around here was difficult at one time. It's a lot better now. I think it's a lot better since he started this business. I heard last night or the night before that the person who's the vigilante lives in this building. I thought, oh, God, not you, Bernard. Oh, please. Because he's the only one I could think of that would have enough, uh, uh, what's the word, enough guts to go out and actually do something to somebody that would try to harm him. He was beaten up badly a few years ago. Police confirmed that Getz was assaulted four years ago on Varick Street in Manhattan by three youths who tried to steal his coat. He later applied for a handgun permit but was denied one because police did not feel his business was prone to robberies. And when police set up a special hotline to glean information on the shootings, they received large numbers of calls praising the vigilante, calling him a hero. Despite this outpouring, Getz is apparently reluctant to return to a town where he's being charged with attempted murder. But it's clear that this so-called vigilante incident has touched a nerve here on 14th Street. Passersby seeing our camera would stop and offer unsolicited comments, no, tell me, tell like those of this man who did go on the record. I'll do the same thing he did. If I have my life in danger like he. There's too much going on out there. 
Police report they have not charged any of the four victims in connection with the subway shooting. Three of the young men shot are expected to recover fully. Three of them are still in the hospital, one paralyzed from the waist down, and the fourth, Barry Allen, is now at home. His mother told me in this exclusive interview she feels both the boys and the man who shot them are victims. You're not going to be able to justify all the wrong things that are done for you ever in life. So if you kill everybody or try to hurt everybody who does something to you, then you, you're just hurting yourself. I mean, you're hurting yourself more deeply. Mrs. Allen isn't sure why people get into trouble today. We, we'd like to think that maybe it's that we're not investing enough time in our children. You know, maybe we're not giving them enough love. Maybe we're not giving them enough support. Maybe we're not giving them enough of whatever it needs, uh, whatever they need in order to make it. But sometimes we ourselves are not aware of what they really need. They are not really aware of what they need. And finally, Mary Allen says she can forgive the man who shot her son. I'm not his, his judge, just as I'm asking him not to be somebody else's judge. Crime in the 80s wasn't just found on the streets. In the high rises of downtown Manhattan, greed hit Wall Street. Wall Street took a beating today, one of its biggest. On paper, big and little investors lost millions, partly because of the scandal surrounding, surrounding Ivan Boesky, the takeover king. That means also that millions of workers have a big stake. When Boesky took over a company, it might have meant liquidations, jobs and towns wiped out. And right at this moment, there have to be a lot of Wall Street fat cats biting their nails, wondering if they might be wiped out too, and follow Boesky into exile and maybe jail. We well, I look like a pirate. <laughs> that is a question Ivan Boesky probably would not want to ask today. With rumors circulating that he'd been wearing a wire, helping tape conversations with fellow traders and other arbitrageurs, the word on Wall Street this afternoon was almost panic. Well, I would think that anyone who has spoken with Ivan Boesky in the last three months must be searching his soul to discover what could conceivably be made of what I said or what he said to me, uh, what, what uh, um, inferences could be drawn that, that uh, could get me into trouble. Boesky, seen here in happier days, ending an attempt to buy the Phillips Petroleum Corporation, has not publicly discussed his guilty plea or the $100 million fine he negotiated with the Securities and Exchange Commission. But back then, he had defended his activities. We are heavily regulated by the government and respect all the laws of the United States of America, and it's not unlawful to seek profit in the United States of America. Today, Boesky's profit-seeking scheme has become known as Arbigate, and it sent Wall Street spinning. The Dow Jones 30 Industrials was down more than 43 points in heavy trading. Other indices were also sharply lower. The uh, troubles with the uh, risk arbitrageurs uh, triggered the selling today. We had very heavy volume, uh, and most of the big moves were concentrated in the uh, takeover stocks. They were the ones down to handfuls of points. But ironically, the Wall Street scandal, to some, is a sign that the system works. The chairman of the House Banking Committee, Brooklyn's Charles Schumer, says it just took some time for the Securities and Exchange Commission to catch on to a new kind of Wall Street crime. Here you had the biggest fish of them all, the most feared, most respected arbitrageur on all of Wall Street, a man who became a multimillionaire in a matter of years. And the SEC got him. And they got him so cold that he didn't even fight it. He pleaded guilty, and he's turning state's evidence. Schumer says his committee's upcoming hearings on the Boesky scandal most likely will not result in new laws, but rather more money for enforcement. In the meantime, traders suggest more caution, more instability, and downtrends in the market. The joke heard on Wall Street tonight that Boesky would spend his Christmas vacation at Club Fed. The question being asked with the joke, how many traders would he take with him? Then in 87, a shocking story of corruption and crime in the ranks of the NYPD rocks the city. The first of 13 cops charged in the scandal at the 77th Precinct went on trial today in State Supreme Court in Brooklyn. The outcome of that trial is up to the jury, but in the 77th Precinct, where residents had turned against the police because of the scandal, Pablo Guzman found that things have changed. The Crown Heights section of Brooklyn, one of the largest and busiest precincts in the city, Last year, officers from this precinct, the 7-7, responded to over 65,000 calls. And also last year, most of the precinct, the neighborhood, and the city were stunned when it was learned that at least 13 cops may have been involved in selling drugs. I was surprised. I was quite surprised. Uh, 
I was, I was shocked exact, actually when it happened. The repercussions of the scandal were far flung. One of the indicted cops, William Gallagher, was flipped or made to cooperate with investigators. The next day, his partner, Brian O'Regan, committed suicide. Commissioner Ward transferred the entire precinct and at first announced changes that were later modified when the PBA threatened a job action. Enter into this picture Inspector Phil Sheridan, 23 years on the force. His job? Rebuild morale at a precinct no officer wanted to be assigned to and restore the confidence of the community. You inherited what some people might consider to be a, a mess. How did you go, go about trying to turn things around? Well, I wouldn't call it a mess. I, call, I would call it a challenging assignment. And, and I, I see community as uh, looking forward to uh, a new relationship. Uh, the bottom line is uh, people need cops. They need us. We uh, have a commanding officer that uh, goes out of his way to explain step by step uh, his operation. The community must be convinced that this is not just a temporary thing. What happens is they see policemen on every corner. You're all over the place. We've never seen so many policemen. The district manager of Community Board 8 isn't alone in his regard of Inspector Sheridan and the changes that have been made at the 7-7. We are more at ease because we have been we have been told by the I call him our uh, captain he doesn't carry that title, though, but he says that he's going to do a good job, and we are willing to give them a chance. The scandal which rocked this precinct and this neighborhood left a deep wound, one which is far from healed. But it seems that both parties have come a long way towards ironing out their differences and trying to work as one. And finally, the 80s marked a dark chapter in the city's fight to keep drugs off the streets, a fight that claimed countless lives. Whether you know it or not, it's touching you somehow. Just look around. Look what's happened. Drug raids are our new westerns, cops and robbers, good guys and bad guys. But the story of what drugs are doing to our city, the story of a war being fought and lost on a lot of fronts by countless New Yorkers, crack is changing the face of this city. It's affecting our children, schools, businesses, the quality of our life today and tomorrow, and goodness knows for how much longer. The police and the drug enforcement agents and the judges will all tell you crack is the worst drug they've ever battled, and the toll it's taking on our city is very high. When police officer Eddie Byrne was gunned down, murdered in cold blood, guarding the house of a man who had the guts to be a witness against drug dealers, the message was very clear. Todd was standing there laughing. At the car, like he said, David talking in the car. He, 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 oh, you blew his brains out. You know, one of the bullets came through the door. He said, this is this is what Todd was saying. And Todd, he said, Todd said it was like a joke. He said, he shot the cop brains. He said, I seen the cop's brains come out. I seen the brains. Scott Cobb drove the car for Ed Burns' killers. Do you think the police will ever be able to stop crack in the streets of this city or any other city? It'll never go away? No. Why? It'll never go away. Think because you put away one of us that is over that that is over with. It's like it's like it's like it's like 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 like, like, like plants growing. Plant, you just grow, it just grows. You take you take you tear you tear the leaf off. It's still gonna grow. And the same way with the gotta crack go, gotta, organization. Got to go to the roots. Where are the roots of the crack organization? Ain't, ain't no roots to it. <laughs> the brutal arrogance of these drug dealers doesn't stop there. They've made death threats against Mayor Koch, our police commissioner Ben Ward and the head of the Drug Enforcement Agency, and those threats are taken very seriously. Commissioner Ward, for example, now carries an automatic pistol. Last year, seven of New York's finest were killed in the line of duty. Five of those killings had to do with drugs. And obviously, if dealers will kill cops, they'll kill anybody. In December, six children in the backseat of a car watched as their mother and aunt were killed. A message to their husbands. She was always an achiever, always working, always getting, uh, you know, uh, working towards something. And what about the innocent ones who just happened to get in the way? Like the young art student who went to Pratt and was killed by a crack addict for a purse. And how about the pregnant ballerina who was hit and crippled by a car out of control? It was driven by a man who still had a hypodermic needle in his arm when the police found him. There's the four and seven-year-old who were caught in crossfires in separate drug shootings last year in neighborhoods where drug-related violence has become part of everyday life. Look at this. 
Would you like to come home to this? I said to him something like, okay, you said you'd get her up. Get her up. And he said, no, we have to be relating when she wakes up. He then said, so let's smoke. And he was talking about smoking free base. Little Lisa's death affected all of us, and here again, drugs were a big part of that tragedy. And how about the horrible death of Jessica Cortez? She was five years old, killed apparently by her mother and her boyfriend, both of whom are accused of being drug addicts. And how many of our sports heroes have been knocked off their pedestals by a puff or a snort? And what does that do to the kids who look up to them? And what can they possibly think when their own teachers or principal gets busted for drugs? If the leaders are like that, imagine the rest that follows him. I, I just felt like taking my daughter back, you know, back inside the, to the house because I, I get scared. She's always asking me a lot of questions, you know. She asked me, Mommy, what's crack? And that's this week's Crime in the City. Subscribe for more at youtube.com slash fox5ny.